Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter and I'm David Mulco and we begin tonight with growing frustration over the vote in Clackamas County where tonight just a fraction of ballots have been tallied and the criticism is pouring in over a count that shut down overnight and lack of clarity over just how long it's going to take. Catherine Cook joins us now and Catherine you were face to face with the county clerk today. She's the one in charge. What did she tell you? Why wasn't her team prepared? Laurel, the answer Clerk Sherry Hall gave us was logistics. She suggested volunteers and election staff didn't know that they would need more help counting and duplicating ballots until just recently. But she's promising to address the problem with a new plan and increased staff starting tomorrow. To what degree do you take personal accountability for what happened? I am the clerk and it is my responsibility, and I absolutely don't like what happened. Clackamas County Clerk Sherry Hall addressing a massive and ongoing delay of election results in her county. For the last two weeks, Hall knew that about two-thirds of the ballots they'd sent out had a printing error. She knew it was taking bipartisan teams a lot of time to hand duplicate the faulty ballots and re-enter them. But by 8 p.m. election night, just 10,000 votes had been counted. I thought of all the candidates who are maybe uh, not close at all in Clackamas County because that's very few, but just, you know, that really want to know uh, quickly if they've won or not. So we uh, are going to strive to get this work done as quickly as we can. That wasn't good enough for county officials, including Chair Tootie Smith. This was a big mistake. It was a huge mistake, and it's not one that I'm happy with at all. On Wednesday, county officials held an emergency meeting to discuss the issue. They also committed more workers from other departments to help count the ballots. So I'm offering to clerk call county employees up to 200, if necessary, starting tomorrow, every day, until the counting is done, including weekends. As of Wednesday, Clackamas County had received around 91,000 ballots, with more expected by mail. Hall said it would take days or weeks to get through them all, but promised to meet the June 13th deadline when certified results have to be in. But how did it get to this point? Why the seeming lack of urgency on Hall's part to step up to a problem she'd known about for weeks? This was her answer. We have spent a lot of time just kind of trying to figure things out. There's been a lot of interruptions, too. The press really has been in the office a lot, and um, there's lots of interruptions. But this is going to go better from tomorrow on. Are you blaming the press? No, I'm just saying there's a whole bunch of things that have just come up that have had to be addressed. And um, you guys are great because you get the word out accurately, right? We should mention there are no questions about election integrity here. It's just going to take time. We, of course, will keep checking in on their progress and keep you updated. Laurel. Thank you, Catherine. And, and one of the biggest races that could be impacted by this delay is the U.S. House District 5 seat. Jamie McLeod Skinner is leading incumbent Kurt Schrader by a 60 to 40 percent margin, but not a lot of votes are in. If Schrader loses, it would be the first time since 1980 an incumbent member of Oregon's congressional delegation lost a primary. We did hear from Schrader tonight in a statement. He said, quote, I remain optimistic that our message to Oregon families has resonated with voters across the 5th congressional district. We will wait until the final votes are counted, including those here in Clackamas County, because every vote matters. And the crowded field of candidates for Oregon governor has been narrowed down to these three women. Tina Kotek for the Democrats, Betsy Johnson running as an unaffiliated candidate, and Christine Drazen on the right for the GOP. With those three, we are breaking new ground and also setting the stage for a race that could be the state's most expensive ever. Here's Pat Doris. With Drazen now the projected winner of the Republican primary, Oregon has made history. Three women are running for governor in November. Oregon hasn't even had two women in major political parties run against each other for that office. We talked with Multnomah County Chair Deborah Kafori about what this means for women in politics. The fact that we have women in so many high positions of power in Oregon. You know, we have a secretary of state who's a woman. We have a woman Supreme Court justice. We have um, in Wash in Multnomah County, we have um, we have all five of our county commissioners are women. 
Clackamas County Chair, Washington County Chair, all women. Um, I, I, it's not it's not by accident, and I know that it's been taken years and years and years of work on behalf of women all over our state to encourage, to support, to grow women candidates, to be able to get to this point where they could run for governor. And now we have three women who hopefully will be in, in the runoff in November. Kafori's mother, Gretchen Kafori, was a trailblazer for women in Oregon politics. She served in the State House, Multnomah County Commission, and Portland City Council. She also helped found the Oregon chapter of the National Organization for Women. On the story, I also talked to our political analysts about what the campaigns will have to do now to try and win the general election. You can watch our full coverage on the KGW YouTube channel. And for a complete look at all of the candidates and election results as the numbers trickle in over the next few days and sadly potentially weeks, check out our continuing coverage. That's at KGW.com. To get you caught up on tonight's other headlines, a medical transport helicopter has crashed in Lake County. That's in South Central Oregon. A witness sent us these photos of the wreckage. The Airlink chopper was trying to land in Christmas Valley to retrieve a patient. The patient was not yet on board when the chopper went down. Four crew members were on board. They were all injured and taken to the hospital. We're still trying to find out how badly they were hurt. The NTSB will investigate the cause of the crash. Gresham police are investigating a shooting tonight that seriously injured a man. This was in the Rockwood neighborhood on Southeast Yam Hill and 190th. Shots were fired just before seven. Officers have been on scene for several hours now gathering evidence. The victim has life threatening injuries. No word yet on a suspect. And someone stole SWAT gear and a rifle from a member of the Marion County Sheriff's Department. This is a picture of similar equipment. The member was off duty when his personal vehicle was broken into. Along with a vest and helmet, the thieves took an AR-15 style rifle along with ammo and a gas mask. The sheriff said they'll be doing an internal review to see if any policies were violated. The former cellmate of romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy took the stand today in her murder trial. The witness told the jury she and Brophy became friends when they were housed in the same prison. She claims Brophy told her she was just feet away when her husband Daniel was killed. She told me that he was shot two times to the heart and um, that it, and she showed me the distance. She said he was shot two times to the heart, and she said it was about, and she used her arm span, because I said, wow, that must have been close up, you know, and she used her arm span and said, well, it was about this far. And Brophy previously testified she was at home riding at the time of her husband's murder, but surveillance video also shows her driving by the scene around that same time. Her defense team tried to call into question the former cellmate's credibility because she's serving time for fraud and identity theft. We expect the trial to wrap up in the coming days. Well, the pandemic is not yet over. That is the message from state health officials tonight who say highly transmissible subvariants of Omicron are making more and more people sick. Now, during a virtual press conference, Dr. Dean Seidlinger said COVID cases and hospitalizations have doubled in recent weeks, though he noted those in hospital remain well below the Delta and Omicron peaks. A little good news there. For now, D Dr. Seidlinger says everyone needs to be extra careful, especially those at high risk of severe illness. Those with underlying medical conditions or who are immunocompromised should consider contacting their healthcare providers now to make a plan to get tested and receive treatment should they become ill. And he also encouraged anyone at high risk to wear masks in indoor public places and said even those at lower risk should consider it. But even as counties issue recommendations, he does not think the state will actually bring back a mask mandate. A handful of Portland Starbucks stores have now voted to unionize. According to the Portland Mercury, employees at the Southeast 28th and Powell Starbucks, along with the one at Southwest 5th and Oak, Northeast 23rd and Burnside, and Northeast Brand, Brand and Lloyd locations have become the first to unionize. They joined a string of Starbucks across the country to unionize in recent months. 